Well, here we are in Lansing, Michigan, and I have the honor of speaking with one of my friends and one of the guys that I served with in Vietnam in 1968 and 1969. And Larry Lemire, it is my pleasure to see you once again, my friend. I I can't remember how many years ago, but it's been several. <laughs> I, I came and visited Larry, and, and of course at that time I had a yellow steno pad and a pencil, and I wrote some notes and so forth, but as this progressed into a real serious oral history of the unit, then I, I thought, well, I, you're one of the first guys I had to get back to, so that's, that's why we're here tonight. And to start off, I'd just like to ask a couple of simple questions, like, what's your date of birth, Larry? Uh, May 20th, 1949. Okay. And where were you born and raised? Uh, Bay City, Michigan. Okay. And uh, did did you stay there during your childhood and were you raised there through like... Yeah, I was... Through high school or whatever? Uh, right from birth till I moved down here about 1990. Oh, okay. And did you join the Army or did you get drafted? No, uh, my serial number is RA 6801159. And that was RA meant? Regular Army. And that means you joined. What What were your thoughts at that time? What motivated you to go down and, and sign up? Actually, I don't remember. <laughs> I mean, was it? Did it have anything to do with some of your buddies were doing it, or your high school? You really? You want to know what really? Yeah. Starship Troopers. Good, good uh, series. Uh, I believe what Robert Heinlein said that if you aren't willing to put your life on the, on the line for your country, you have no right to vote. That that's pretty strong. Uh, and as and a young guy, I mean, you were young. Uh, at uh, Nineteen. As a young man, you know. A lot of guys weren't thinking like that, uh, obviously. Uh, so, what was, let's see, this is bad, Tim, I can't, oh, how old were you when you went in? Uh, 19, I think. Okay, and what were you doing at the time that you joined? In other words, were you working someplace, were you married, or what, what, what was your, your state in life at that point? Actually, I, I had just gotten out of high school, gone down to visit a friend in Tupelo, Mississippi, and I had actually in, intended to join the Air Force. Okay. But when I got back here up to Bay City from uh, Mississippi, they told me that somebody, I was supposed to go to electronics school, they told me that somebody who already had some schooling had bumped me for my position, so I basically said to hell with that, went down, joined the Army, and was, was in Detroit a week later. Oh, wow. That, that didn't take long, did it? <laughs> that didn't take long They got all. your hand raised in a quick hurry. So where did you do basic training? Uh, Fort Knox. Okay, and tell me what your impression was when you got off. The, I'm assuming you got bused there. Yeah, we went from Detroit to... What was your impression, or what was happening around you when you got off the bus? Just a bunch of strangers didn't know where to go, what to do. Thank God for first or for uh, DIs. Did they welcome you with handshakes and? No. Nope. Oh, they didn't. No, nope, they just get off the bus, line up, put your feet on the marks. So were they kind of strict, sort of? I mean, were they coming across as being kind of? They were. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And your first couple of days, of course, as we all went through basic, we know. There was uh, a couple of days where you had to go get your, you know, you know, your fatigues and all that. They took you through a building and you went in a line and a guy just kept handing you stuff. You, you remember that, right? Actually, I don't even remember the haircut. I was, that was my next question. Did you, did you remember though, do you remember the guys like after they got their haircut? Do you remember what, it was, it was shaved, right? <laughs> did you have long hair or short hair when you went in? Uh, moderately short. Okay, so it was no, it wasn't a big no heartbreak for you, because I remember when I was in basic from San Diego. Remember, we had a lot of thugs hippies. and a lot of hippies, <laughs> and they had long, and it was nasty. Some of their hair was really ratty and you know dreadlocky or whatever you want to call it, and some of those guys when they sat in that chair and that guy took his first draw, tears started running down their eyes. And that hair, you would have thought, meant more to them than anything. But you know what? They had no choice. And that was the deal. 
So uh, everybody came out of there bald, you know, number one or whatever that it wasn't very long. <coughs> and then in basic, what do you remember him teaching you? What was the main course of study in basic? Actually, I got, I screwed up, I volunteered. Anybody out here want to be a fireman? Oh, wow, fireman, I'll bet you, I wonder how they train you. That sounds like a good, <laughs> good thing to do. So I did, volunteered to be a fireman, and I ended up stoking furnaces, which is fireman. But uh, I got out of a lot of training. I got to sleep warm behind the furnace when I was oh, supposed yeah. to be out now, tending them. Now, were those in the barracks? Yeah, each barracks had a so that coal was, furnace. Okay, did they also give you the responsibility as being the fire guard? Do you remember at night one guy had to take the flashlight and they had a special hat with white? Yeah, I don't remember ever being a fire guard. And then guard. they had to walk around because uh, where I was at, we were on the old barracks, the second floor. All wood, remember the old wood barracks? Oh, yeah. That's, that's what you were. Okay, yeah. I think they were left over from World War II or something. They were. So, and on the top floor, there was only one door at the end and a ladder. And so I guess the Army's thinking was, is well, if there is a fire start in, in this thing, these guys on the top floor are toast. They, they'll never be able to get downstairs. There's only one way out. And if they get early enough warning then maybe most of them can get out. That was their thinking. But uh, what I remember is, is everybody took a turn at fire guard. It wasn't a punishment, it was just what you did. And I remember the night that I took fire guard, all, all I remember is walking around listening to a bunch of guys farting and snoring and, and uh, talking in their sleep, you know. And so it wasn't a, a lot of fun. I mean, that wasn't the duty that everybody wanted. So what about, uh, when you st when they started training you with weapons, what do you remember about that? I had never fired a rifle in my life before joining the army, <clears throat> and I just wished I fell in love with the M14. I wish that, I so you, one. I did. In other words, we started with the M14 as well. Okay. If I had the money, I'd have one today. I remember the 460 meters uh, full size silhouettes, putting 16 out of 18 oh, in the buddy. silhouette. And you never fired before. And, but I was shooting groups about the size of a folded over dollar bill, but I couldn't get them, you know, within 18 inches of each other. I just wish I had more time to let the <coughs> fire be gun. Wow. And we went through basic rifle marksmanship, remember yeah. the 25 meter range and how to sight it in and all that stuff. So you, you kind of took to it. You kind of said, this is pretty neat. I like this. Well, I like firing the gun. I yeah. didn't like what we had to do with them. Oh, yeah. But so then, what other training do you remember besides that? Well, I remember I remember being worried that I wasn't going to fa pass my first aid, uh, you know, the test. field field emergency class. Yep, I remember it well. And how did you do? I barely passed it, but I made it. Okay, good. And then, how was the PT? What it what were when you went in, were you a runner? Were you in? No, I was 145 pounds, six foot one, scrawny bean pole. Uh, when I got out of AIT, I was 185 pounds, a little less scrawny, but still a bean pole. But you were bulking up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you did because of what they were doing to you. <laughs> but what I remember the most is those overhead bars. Oh yes. Did you do well, or did you not do so well? I did not do so well. And why well, you you didn't do a basic at Fort Knox? No, I was at Fort Ord. Fort Knox in uh, well, about January gets down to like ten degrees, and we were doing the bars in our bare hands. Oh yeah, and they were so about that big around. You couldn't get a grip on them, so you start to swing from one to the other, and you fall off. Did you get blisters on your hands? Oh yeah, that that was one of my problems. And then they froze to the bars. Yep. That, and so when you got blisters and they broke and you had to go the next day and do it again, that was, this was not good. And so a lot, I don't know of a lot of guys, but I in particular really struggled with the bars. That was one of my tough, that was one of my toughest ones. And then was it, refresh my memory, was it in basic that each guy had a half of a, of a tent half and 
two poles. Did they do the bivouac during basic? Oh yeah. Or was that a? I can't. I couldn't remember. If Actually, that, we did it both. We did one in basic, okay. and then we did an overnighter in AIT too. Okay. What was your impression of that particular exercise? Do you remember the guy that you were partnered Actually, with? Actually, I don't. Okay. Did when you joined, was there anybody going in that you knew? No. And the reason I ask that is a, a lot of guys in small towns, it was like half their high school class of guys got drafted. And there were a lot of guys together, you know, in, in basic and AIT, but then they all got split up, you know, of course, when they went to Vietnam. So I wondered if you... No, there were some people from my hometown. I don't think we had any in my uh, platoon, but in the company we had... Uh, some people from Bay City, a couple of them. And so you, that, okay, but yeah, not not like a bunch. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then tell me about AIT. What after basic you graduated, and electric uh, electric radio school went out the door, and now they said your name and they read off where you what MOS you were going to be and where you were going. What did they say when they when they raised, when they called your name? Uh, I. All I remember is I was 11 Bravo 10. And they said, did they tell you where you were going to AIT? Yeah. I don't remember what the name of it. All I remember is it's just outside Anniston, Alabama. And what, that was Polk? No. Where did you go for AIT? That, I don't remember the name of the fort, whatever. Okay, but it was out, say that again, it was out of? It was just outside Anniston, Alabama. Alabama, okay, I'll, I'll, re I'll remember that. And same thing, they probably bust you, I'm assuming. You got off the bus. Was it the same as basic or was it different? Well, it was just a continuation of basic, except I fell in actual hate of the M16. Oh, I was going to ask you, when did you get introduced to the M16? In AIT? In AIT. We did too. And, and the only thing I liked about it, it was lighter. That was the only advantage I thought because I could shoot an M14 really well. And I, I came from a background where my dad and I hunted a lot and my dad had guns all of his life. And so, I not like you, but I mean I'd done some shooting and hunting. So I that M14 was just like a 30 out 6 as far as I was concerned and I'd been shooting that for a long time. The M16, not so much. It To me, the M16 was wild and and kind of uncontrollable, you know, and especially when you go semi or automatic and whatnot. So I, and then one of the problems I had is there was vicious rumors going around about the M16. Do you remember that? Uh, <clears throat> only that it was a piece of junk, it jammed up in the jungle, uh, which is true. It's the all, original ones. It's were. all true. And do you remember the the flash suppressor on the front? The I remember the old uh, tree leaf clover that they had to change really quick because it kept getting snagged in the brush and then and somebody the closed and then uh, somebody pull around off and it would blow up in their face well, I don't remember anything about that but that's why they had to change it because if that thing dipped down and got in the weeds or anything you know if you plug up the end of the rifle it doesn't work very good when, <laughs> when you pull the trigger so m16 and okay what else did you did you learn in AIT well let's see I remember couldn't do it again to save my life. We had to adjust headspace and timing on a uh, M250 caliber. That's right. And M60, we got we got to shoot that. Oh, got, I fell in love with the M60. So you liked it right from the get-go. Yeah, I like. I remember dusting a column a kilometer away with the M60, and it's, you could see a little dust box. Wow, I, I remember that day when we got to shoot that. You know, I remember that was really exciting. It was starting to get exciting then, when they started letting you shoot that. Do you remember when they took us to the Laws rocket range? The sh remember the Laws rocket? Yeah, I remember the Law rocket. And you shot a few of those, I'm couple, assuming. Shot a couple of them, yeah. Okay. Did you ever, I don't remember, did you ever shoot the 90 recoilless? No, I never did. Okay. Well, you'd have been a fool if you did, because you'd have had to be carrying that monster out through the, I mean... Remember Russ well, Bruns, the little guy that carried it all the time? I remember we were out in the boonies somewhere and we were walking on like compressed, matted uh, rice, you know, rice stalks. Yep. And he'd walking along, walking along, all of a sudden, he fell right through him from the weight. I guess yep. he carried two rounds in the 90. 
and the 90, and he and had an ammo bearer that carried three <clears throat> on his back. I, I I was there. I remember the day. Yeah, that and he was he wasn't very he was skinny, and he wasn't very tall. By the way, Russ Bruns lives in Ulm, Montana. He lives uh, 30 miles from me, so it was coincidentally he went back to Illinois after the, after the war. He got hurt I, the night that you remember when they went in to save the uh, Lerps that were trapped, and a couple of them had gotten killed and. They called Charlie Company up and said, "Hey, we got to. You got to get in there and see if we can get them." They were surrounded, and you were on that one, weren't you? Where they dropped you guys off, and and that wasn't that when Moose and Russ got hurt that night. Was that? That was the night. <clears throat> I didn't have any idea what we were doing out there. I just remember that we went out there and got busted on by an, what they said was an RPG battalion. Yeah. Well, it, if it wasn't, it sure acted like it. <laughs> And so uh, that's and also when the sergeant, I think, put me in for the Silver Star, which is because the captain and me didn't get along too well. I believe that was Captain Eichner. That was good old Harry Eichner. Her Harry, okay. And, uh, but that what was. Why does he call him Harry what? Eichner. That's his name, is Eichner. Oh, I thought he Do you had remember it. the night of the graveyard? Oh, of course. <laughs> Yeah, we actually set up in graveyards often. No, do you remember when he had us dig up a graveyard and then he went one, two, three, and sent it in as a body count? Oh, of course. Oh, he he declared body count on imaginary... If he saw a blood trail, it was a body count. Remember that? I if don't remember that, if, but I but remember... If, he, if, if, if we'd call in, he... Oh, I remember this. He'd always tell either Glover or... or uh, uh, Oh, who was the E6 one? Yeah, I'm trying to remember. He got his ass blown off Yeah. during the... Oh, God. Freddie Hanna. Hanna, Sergeant Fre Hanna. Freddie Hanna. Hanna. you got to forgive me. Sometimes I get a lot going up here, and it gets a little confusing. And they'd always... Eichner would always get on him. If you see a drag mark, if you see anything that looks like a blood trail, call, call me. I want to know. Well, what he was doing is he was calling... He was counting his body count. And... You probably even better than I know why he was doing that. Politics. And he was trying to punch his own ticket to get promoted, recognized, right? That. So uh, somebody told me he wanted to go into politics and come back home, and yep. a good body count was... Oh, and as many awards as you could possibly get, and so forth and so on. So you graduated from basic, and... Did they give you the 21 days off or whatever? Yeah, we got a month off. Okay, and where did what did you do with it? We just went home. And anything in particular you remember about those weeks? No, I just I wandered around, visited friends. They did the same thing as that's what I <coughs> that's what I did too. You were at your folks' house. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that I you know that's that's a common story. A lot of a lot of times I always thought guys would go home and get wild and go do crazy stuff, but I think we had a lot on our mind. You know, we knew where we were going. Yeah, we and, knew where we were going. And, and it, was so, it was somewhat sobering, you know, if, if you know what I mean. And so, when you got, they got, I believe, if, if they did with you what they did me, they put us on buses and hauled us to, I left out of Oakland. Do you remember, where did you leave for Vietnam? I left out of Oakland too, okay, so I had to fly. You flew there. in, yep, you did. And in San Diego, of course, they weren't going to spend the money on an aircraft when they could put you on an uncomfortable bus and just take you up 101, you know, it's San Francisco and Oakland. <coughs> and do you, do you remember anything about that sta the reception station there? Well, I remember I was a day late, and my mother had, uh, uh, what do you call it, Hire somebody special to send my orders because I'd forgotten all my paperwork. Oh my gosh. So I was looking, you know, oh my God, they're going to give me Article 15 right, right from the word go. And we ain't even got started yet. <laughs> so did that work? Did she get them? And oh yeah, I got everything. And the people that I got out of uh, AIT with all left the day before I did because I had to wait for my paperwork. They all went to the big red one. Oh. And I ended up going to the 25th. Okay. That's interesting. You know, karma, right? And whatever you call it, uh, when things happen just for a reason somehow or another, this happened and not a mistake, but, you know, 
kind of a, I wonder if that was part, you know, I wonder if that wonder was meant, meant to be. Who's watching out for me? Yeah, I wonder if that was meant to be. So, what was your, you flew over, of course, did you get to go in a commercial airline yeah. like United? Okay. You know, some of the guys got stuck going on those military uh, transit planes that had web seats hanging from, oh, that was brutal. And so I went on a United. A lot of guys went on Flying Tiger. I, do you remember what airline you went on? I don't. It was probably United or yeah. might have been TWA. Could have been, yeah. And what do you remember about that flight besides it being long? Well, I remember we didn't. <laughs> I remember we had to stop in Hawaii to refuel or change planes, I just remember. But I got to see the koi in the pond and then we had to re -implane and for Benoit. Mm -hmm. And so. God, that was a long flight, wasn't it? That was a long, was it, what was it? Some 20 some hours. 24 hours, I think. And uh, so we got to Benoit, and then they trucked us or bussed us or something over to Long Ben, where, the, where they were receiving the new crew to come in. But I don't know, was Long Ben where the Ruppel Duppel was? Because all I remember is they yeah. bussed us over there. Yep, that's it. And so, do you remember how many days you were in Long Ben? Because you had to stay there and wait for your orders. They, nobody knew where they were going at that point. Remember sit, sitting in the bleachers? I don't. Twice a day, you were told to be there at, at 8 in the morning and at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. I must not have been there very long because I remember I got uh, burning detail. <coughs> yep. And the next day I was gone. Yeah, so you your orders came down, down pretty, pretty quick. quick. Yeah. And well, it was right after the Tet Offensive and I think like half our company was gone. That's true. So... They were real anxious to get new blood. Yeah. Yep. Do you remember how you got to Coochie? Deuce and a half truck? Deuce and a half. Yep, I, pretty much everybody else did too. And when you got to Coochie, I, I think the company clerk came out. Remember the Quonset hut where the company clerk and CO stayed there in Coochie in the Charlie Company area? He came out and when he got off the truck, you had to kind of stand there and line up a little bit and then uh, he came out, and the company clerk when you got there was Dave Kelly, Teach. They, his nickname was Teach. D did you were you aware of that? No, I, my memories of Vietnam are really really spotty. Okay. I got like little flashes sure through the whole year. And then he handed each one of us a lighter, and it had a Wolfhound crest and an electric or an electric strawberry. I can't remember on it. Do you remember getting one of those? I remember getting a lighter with the wolf head crust on it, but yep. I thought it was when I left. No, it was when you it was when you got there. Because we had a choice. We could get a letter opener or a, the lighter or something else. I forget what. Well, I'll tell you where the lighters came from. Teach's dad was a, manu a tractor heavy equipment and implement dealer in Indiana, a manufacturer, and he was talking... or corresponding with Teach, and Teach said, you know, these guys coming in, I, you know, I'd like to have them have something to remember Vietnam by. Do you think you could get some Zippo? Of course, that was the lighter of the day. And he sent him a crest and an electric strawberry. Just remember the little crest. And uh, he said, if you could get some of that and then have them engraved with this and send them home and then kind of forgot about it. And then one day, here comes 500 Zippo lighters in cases. And he opened it up, and there were all these lighters. So he just started every new guy that came into the company. He handed them one of those lighters. And it came in a box. It was in a nice yeah. little black box. And so, uh, you know, I never forgot that. I thought, man, that was pretty nice. But I look back, and, you know, his dad was rich. I mean, I, I'm not saying that in a bad way, but I mean, this guy was loaded. He was a manufacturing company. You know, that's in the days when you made money, you could really keep it. You know, the, it was good good times. And so we got that lighter. Do you remember when they said, you're going to be going out to uh, second platoon in the field? Do you remember how you got from Coochie to, and where they took you? No, really, I okay. don't. Okay, they took you to fire support base Crockett. You remember Crockett? Nope. It was right next to a, a graveyard, a graveyard right outside the wire. And it was kind of a, a, they set it up in kind of a hasty 
manner and we had some 105s in there and and uh, we were at Crockett for a good amount of time. I've got pictures <coughs> of you there. So I mean, I know I know that all of us that, that in our time period when you and I were there, we went, that was where we went first. And then well, after the only thing I remember I remember <coughs> vaguely a fire support base with the little coke kids oh, yeah. running around the wire. What I remember mainly was the train bag bridge. Oh yes. Yep. And and by the way, the the little kids with the with the Coke kids, they did that at Crockett. I mean they were going around there all the time. And you remember the ladies that would come up and offer their services and so forth out. So they were never allowed in, but guys would go out and uh, behind the burn. I remember somebody, hey, mister, you want to meet my sister? Oh, well, yeah. Come on, bring her down. We'll, we'll try her out. Sure. Oh, you know a fucking Ted G.I. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it was a lot of memories there. So when we got to Crockett, what do you remember the first... First of all, what weapon did they give you to take out to the field? What were you supposed to be in the beginning? M16 rifle. A rifle, okay. Like, all of, I suppose all of us. And when you got there, what was the first mission? Or what was your first, when we left the wire, what was it? Do you remember the very first time you left the wire? On purpose. We were just uh, doing a sweep out and around. We okay. did a lot of those. Anything come of it? No. Nope. Did you? Well, yeah, something did come of it. We stopped by an old dilapidated, busted down hooch with a, you know, the mud wall. And I sat down and I got up and left my rifle there. Ooh. <laughs> oh, I'm surprised Glover didn't kill me. But we went back and fortunately it was still there. How long after you guys left did you realize I'm armless? Uh, 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 probably Glover. He said, Where's your rifle? What? Where? Oh, oh, oh God! Oh. And so about face. Because I was I was just out for a while. About face, and in fact, you know, Glover was pretty good about that, though. And you know, he was dealing with us new guys all the time. Well, I remember if Glover wanted to cut my throat once, or at least he made me believe that he did. Wasn't that Sergeant Hannah? No, that was Glover. Oh, okay. Sergeant Hannah, me and Sergeant Hannah had some go arounds too, but. I fell asleep on guard duty. That was that was the incident that I was that, thinking about. That was Sergeant Glover. Oh, it was Glover. Okay, because yeah. the story got twisted a little bit and said it was it was Hannah. And you know, I thought back and I thought, gosh, Hannah was kind of a mild mannered. I didn't think he would. Sergeant be. Hannah got really really mad at me. I forget what I'd done, but he told me I was a lousy soldier. I said, Sergeant, I'm not a soldier. I'm a civilian in uniform trying to serve my country. And for some reason, that set him off. He never did give me every bit piece of crap he could from the t that time till the time he got killed. And how long had you been there when that relationship started to go a little south? Uh, I don't remember. I don't remember me and Sergeant Hannah really hitting it off at all. Okay, so it, that may have been the beginning of the Lemire legacy then. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> if it was, wasn't it good about it? So, and of course, you know, you were there with me that night when he got killed, and and that was. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't want to be telling stories that could get me put in prison even at this late date. But that was the night that Harry Eichner almost got his ass killed. Exactly. Yep. Because I was shooting at him. Yep. And uh, well, you know what? Everybody knows. <laughs> well, no, I mean, just, no, what I mean to say is, is everybody that was there Well, knows. you know why I was shooting at him? Go ahead. Because the son of a bitch called in an artillery strike right on top of his own company. Mm -hmm. And you know what his side of the story was? He was trying to push gooks into us. Uh, yeah. That, well, that was, that was his story. So, you were doing riffs. Do you remember the first ambush patrol you went on? And by the way, were you a machine gunner yet? That started out as a rifleman. I was a radio man for a really short time. Oh, okay. I don't know why, but uh, then I went and carried the machine gun almost at least six months, I guess. Do you remember who you took it from? No. Okay. And first ambush patrol you remember? My first one or the first one I remember? Because the only one I remember is the one where we busted on another platoon or another 
Yeah, platoon of our own company. Uh, don't you remember that it was kind of vice versa? It was Delta Company and we were walking out at night on the berm? No, actually we were set up and we busted on somebody that was walking the berm. Huh. That, that might have been a different time. And the, the uh, lieutenant's rationale, at least as I heard it, was that uh, he, didn't, he thought that the gooks might be listening to the radio, so he didn't want them to know that he was moving up. Oh, I'll be darned. Do you remember who the lieutenant was? No, I don't. Okay. You remember Jamie O'Brien? I don't think he was there yet, was he, during when that incident happened? I have very... <laughs> all I remember is uh, Charlie 26. <laughs> you kind of obsessed on Charlie 26. How about Cy Krebling? Remember Lieutenant Krebling when he came in and he wasn't infantry, he was an engineering officer? Nope. And that's when we were at Crockett, of course. And this came out much later. All of us kind of wondered why would an engineer officer come out and want to go with a straight leg infantry deal? And because he only had six months left, you know, that, and the story was is he thought that if he came with us and got in a firefight, he'd get a CIB. That was his thought. He didn't. He probably would have. No. No. The only MOS that qualifies for a CIB is 11B. Period. I thought anybody who carried... 11B. There were a lot of guys that were RTOs, like artillery, forward observers. They'd never qualified for a CIB. I thought they all should have got them, per personally. I thought if you were out there with us and we were in a firefight and you were in a gunfight with us, you you got it. That's what I thought. I mean, that's that's what I thought. But I found, had to find out later that... And so when Cy left, he kind of asked, well, when, when do I get my orders for CIB? And, and uh, he did not get along with Eichner at all. And so Eichner made him feel foolish and tried to embarrass him and about the whole routine about, you know, well, you don't, you spent your time wasting your time then if you thought you were gonna. And Cy Krevlin was a good, good lieutenant. And the reason he was good is because when he first came to us, Glover was running the platoon and he came in. He was the first officer I'd ever seen in the platoon. We, Glover was the only guy running the platoon when I, when I was new there. And he went up to Glover and he says, well, he says, uh, I just want to let you know right now, I know that in theory I'm supposed to run the platoon. That's what it said, you know, the Army Manual says that. But I'm smart enough to know that, Sergeant Glover, you were on the platoon. And so if I just, I'm here to help wherever I can. So I, I don't know what I'm doing. But I, I want to learn, and I will learn very quickly, just make sure I'm going in the right direction. And Glover, that put them just like that. And Cy turned out to be a really good lieutenant, and he, we did get in some gunfights with him, with him there, so it was kind of a shame that his dream of having a CIB never, you know, never, never took place. And uh, who do you remember... Who were the guys in the platoon when you first went in? Well, I remember Crazy Willie. Okay. And I remember Cap, uh, Ketchum. Lee Ketchum. Lee Ketchum. Cal Johnson? Mm hmm. Cal Johnson? Mm, don't think so. The name doesn't ring a bell, but then. Was there a rabbi there at that point? No. So I know exactly. Okay, so they had just. They just left. You just crossed paths with them practically. Do you remember Joe Wascom, Big Joe? Oh yeah, Big Joe, Little Joe. And okay, and then the monkey. Yeah, I remember. I remember. Sheila. The monkey and the spider. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get your picture taken with Sheila? No. Every I have pictures of almost everybody with Sheila, and you know what Joe was doing? Five bucks for a picture, and he had a. That's probably why I didn't, because I spent all my money on coats. So, but that, that's the story, that's the story about Sheila. And uh, so you remember those guys, and uh, as, as we got to going, do you remember the Eagle Flights? Oh, I loved Eagle Flights. I did too. Tell us some of your memories of doing Eagle Flights. I just remember I loved being, getting up in the sky and leaning out, 
you know, with my arm around a support post, and looking down. Didn't have to worry too much about being shot at because even if they tried, they probably wouldn't hit you. Yeah. You what, know, what was what was an eagle flight? Oh, uh, moving from uh, base camp out into the field in helicopters. Mm -hmm. Usually a ten ship lift. There was usually ten ships, and all of us would pile in. That would, ten ships were for a company, right? Wasn't that a company movement? I don't remember. I think six I, guys to a helicopter. That was that would have been four or six. Yeah. And I I remember that I was I always kind of got paranoid that I didn't want to get shot down inside the chopper, so I always sat in the door. I sat on the door with my feet on the struts and hung on to the. You well, know, that's the, what I always did too, but I don't remember. I don't remember how many people were actually on the inside. Well, there would be two. I think. I don't remember if I sat on the outside because I carried the machine gun. And you could lay it right, yeah, you could have it accessible right there. And then the door gunner, of course, was right, right yeah, there. Yeah, that's what I was shooting for. I wanted to become a door gunner until I talked to one. He said, man, I've been shot down six times. You don't want to be a door gunner. That would be awful. And a lot of them got killed, as we know. You know, a lot of those Hueys got, got busted, busted up really bad. So, and I, I, like you, have the same feeling. The good times in Vietnam that I remember were flying, and we flew a lot. Charlie Company and, and, and us, we, they sent us out there sometimes one, two, three flights a day. Remember when they'd piggyback us, they'd put us down, we'd go through an area, they'd pick us up, they'd take us to it. Remember that? I vaguely remember it, but it didn't impress me much. Yeah, I liked it because we got to fly. Yeah. I mean, that was, the motiv that was my motivation, as I always... Remember when you could hear the choppers coming and they'd say pop smoke and it was always purple? No, I don't remember purple. I remember red, yellow. And the reason I say purple is there was a saying, kind of a saying, let's purple out of this bad place. That was kind of a slang thing that was going around, let's purple out of this. It wasn't this place, it was something else, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Because <laughs> we don't want to be too offensive here. Uh, so... Remember the Coke kids used to find us when we were out in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> no, actually, I don't. It was weird. Sometimes we'd be out around a village, whatever, but and here comes a Coke kid out of out of the bamboo with his little box. Remember? I, they, no, I remember uh, the mesh bags, the nip, like hammock okay. mesh. Did they have the little piece of ice and they'd spin the Coke on the ice in there? When you bought a Coke, was that. it cold? Well, a lot of times it wasn't. Okay. Well, I remember one time the kid was spinning this thing on a, on a chunk of ice, and when I took my first drink, it burned. It was so cold it like burned my throat, and I thought this is something I haven't experienced in a long time. And then suddenly it came to me: where did he get ice? <laughs> we're out. We're out here in the boonies, and. Later, history will tell us that most of those Coke kids were fronts for the VC, and they were going back reporting, telling them where we were at, how many they wanted to know, how many weapons, what kind, did they have any big 90s, you know, that type of thing. And But the Coke kids, one of them in particular, I remember, had been caught in a napalm blast, and his whole back was scarred, burned, you know, just yeah. burned scars. And it came to my thought, I mean, at that time I thought, why would a kid, he was probably about seven, seven, eight years old, why would a kid that got himself almost killed and ruined by an American napalm raid ever want to do anything nice for a GI? And as it came about, he wasn't out there to be nice. He, act, he treated us really good, and but... That yeah later you know you know about the Coochie barbers. You know, nope. have you ever read the book The Tunnels of Coochie? No, I never read the book. I knew about the Tunnels of Coochie. It's a great read. There's only one book ever written on the Tunnels of Coochie, and it goes into detail. In this book, The Tunnels of Coochie, it goes into great detail about the Coke kids, and their relationship to the BC, and then the barbers, and the barbers didn't talk much. But when there were GIs in there waiting to get a haircut and guys in the chair, they talked. 
they talked a lot, and they didn't never even thought about what they were talking about. These barbers, at the end of each day, would go to their outside. Remember outside the wire? What was that called out there? Uh, oh gosh, why can't I remember? <laughs> I can't Not remember. little coochie, but it, they had a little name for it. And, and a lot of the remember the gooks that worked for the army inside coochie during the day. Nope, they do a, they do odd that. jobs and and they had them sweeping out hooches and and mostly females, mostly women, you know, type of thing. And uh, they found out that these guys were going back at night and writing out every piece of intel that they heard for the day. They would pass that off to another person. They would go take it to another person. Then it would hit a tunnel and they'd beeline to where there was some upper echelon. And that's, that was their one of their number one intel, ways of gathering intel. Not so stupid. I never thought, the only thing I was worried about is when he was shaving my neck, I got, I always got a funny feeling. I just did, you know, I thought, man, if he wasn't, if he didn't like us very much, this would be an opportune time. Definitely a good time. You know, but um, lucky for me, that never happened. Uh, do you remember the first time you were out and somebody got killed? Ooh, doo -doo -doo. The first time anybody ever got killed when I, I think that was uh, Boyle. No, he wasn't the first. That's He's the when, first I remember. Okay, I mean, I mean, I'm not questioning your memory, yeah. but Boyle was much later. I'm, I'm thinking, uh, Hannah was probably towards the front of me because remember when he got blown away that night? Yeah. That was way before Boyle. Was it? Yeah, and uh, so. And of course, there were many, many others at Di at Diamond. You know, uh, what was it? Eight or nine of our guys got killed in Diamond Diamond One Diamond Fire Support Base. And uh, of course, the, they got overrun, and and the guys that were left back in the company, they had two bunkers to man. And it happened to be that the Gook's plan was is they were going to Bangalore that and come through that area, and they did. And the, all the guys ran and got in the bunkers and when the rocket started. And the minute they came in, they had satchel charges and they just went right around every bunker and through, and unfortunately our two bunkers had all the guys in it. And that was a tragedy and a horror, but it was a learning lesson for everybody. From that point on, when, because Diamond got, Diamond 2 got, they tried to overrun that too. And the lesson learned was, is you guys dig firing positions outside the bunker. And then if the rockets come in, you get out of the bunker. You know, it, it goes against logic. You want to be in the bunker so a rocket don't hit you, right? And, of course, the, the gooks never successfully overran a, a diamond fire support base again. But that was a hard lesson, you know, when we lost, when we lost all those guys. And uh, who would you say, did you have anybody in the platoon that was a close buddy to you? That was Boyle. Okay, and that, that came later. Okay, John Boyle from Boise, Idaho. Young fellow that came in and, and nice kid, wasn't he? He was just... Yeah, we used to sit out around the bunkers and sing, you know, old rock and roll songs. Yeah, he was a nice kid. And unfortunately for me, you know, he w was assigned to me, my squad, and, and uh, by and that time I didn't hate new guys. I mean, at this point, because of all the stuff we'd went through, I figured it was better to train them up as quickly as you could, because we used to think the new guys would get us killed. It turned out that the new guys that didn't know anything and weren't trained would surely get, you know, would surely get you killed. And he was one of the ones that I took under my wing, and he was carrying M79, and the night that, that you and I were there with him and Jack Slovey was there, we set up an L ambush right on a berm coming out of the, out of the village. And, of course, that night we popped two claymores and bodies. Uh, the light of the explosion showed bodies flying around. And one of them must have just knee-jerk reaction as he was falling off the berm, sprayed that area, and it went down. I don't know if you got any in front of you, but rounds hit the just the outside of the berm like that and threw dirt up in my face and just zipped right down. Well, the gun, his gun must have just been going like that. And of course, as you and I both know, he got shot 
right right between the eyes just under the edge of the helmet yeah. now he and I what, the last thing I told him last thing I told him before we before we started guard sleeping I said whatever you do if we pop an ambush tonight tonight make sure you get up and start shooting just get let out there and I don't care just get just start shooting okay yep yep I will and of course you know how I feel because he did, and and you know, and then he slumped down. In my mind, he was scared. I understood that, but I kept yelling at him, "Shoot, shoot!" And you were you were just going to town, and uh, so then I, I shook him, and he bent, went over, and the last you know the death rattle sound, you know the air coming out of the lungs and Jack Slovey was right next to him and I'll never forget Jack just Jesus Christ you know he just said oh God Jesus Christ and of course we're in a gunfight I mean you can't do too much at that point and I didn't even know where he'd been shot I, at that point I mean you, we, we were too busy to be looking but uh, I know you told me before that was the most that that was one of the worst nights in Vietnam you ever you ever experienced and it's well I always felt that what I remember and was that uh, I was asleep yes you were and somebody you know shook me and said, exactly. God damn it it ain't time for me to be on guard yet and that's when we busted that you're exactly right and 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 that's why I felt I was the one that got boiled killed as luck would have it I was the one that was awake at that point and then I was going to pass the watch down. There was a guy next to me and then you. And so the new guy that was next to me, it was going to be his turn. But, and so I had the starlight. And I just kept every once in a while looking and once in a while looking. And one time I looked and I thought I saw shadows back down towards that village. And as the closer I looked, I could see that somebody was walking on that berm towards us. And as it got closer, I knew it was somebody walking towards us. And of course, I had the two magnetos right there in front of me, and I thought, well, I got I didn't have time to wake anybody up, right? I mean, you're, and yeah. I'm elbowing Boyle, and I'm elbowing this guy, and what, 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 what? Get ready, you know. All I could whisper is, "Get ready, we're we're going to go at it here," and they did. And then that guy elbowed you, and you're going, "What? <laughs> you know, what do you want?" And so, as this guy got as close to the <clears throat> Claymores that I had set up uh, that I thought would be effective. I just bump boom Nobody on that other line knew anything was going on until those claymores went off Nobody had no there was no time to get anybody any word over there. What do you think they felt like? Probably like mortars had just come in and, and hit us and uh, that was Like you that was that was one of the events that has uh, haunted me for the whole time since I, I've been home from Vietnam. And uh, when I came home, he, he and I kind of had some things in common. We both lived with our dads, divorced parents. He lived in Boise, Idaho. Uh, I was, uh, my dad, he and I, were, were he was raising me. Both of us liked outdoor stuff, hunting, fishing, and so forth. So we kind of had some things in common. And then, uh, you know, I, I regret this every day of my life. When I finally got home in the world, I should have tried to find his dad and, and tell him that I was there, you know, when his son died. But you know what? We didn't do that a lot for whatever reason, whether we just weren't in a frame of mind to do it. But I, I often regretted that I didn't. And then when I did start looking for guys, it was too late. His dad had, had passed. So I kind of, that always kind of bothered me, bothered me as well. So, uh, let's see. Who, who do you remember was the platoon sergeant during that time in, in our tour? The only platoon sergeant I remember was Glover. How about Marquez? No. Oh, Martinez. Marquez. Marquez? Gonzalez Marquez. Do you remember the nickname that we gave him? Nope. Flat dick. <laughs> I don't remember that. I remember that 
that night that uh, Moose got, I thought it was RPG shrapnel in his chest. It was. Among other things, evidently. Yeah. Dirt, but, uh, rocks, yeah, the, some bullet holes. <laughs> that, like, I mean, they didn't even know at the time. The sergeant was like right next to me. Sergeant Marquez. Do you remember when he'd go, what in the goddamn hell you think you do, you sunny beach? Nope. Oh, he was, he, when he'd get on somebody, he, you know, that Puerto Rican in him would really come out. But he was a good, he was a good soldier. He was an excellent soldier. <coughs> did you get an R&R? &R? Yep. Where did you go? I went to Sydney. You, you got to go to Australia? I waited 11 months. Mm -hmm. Really? Because I, I thought those were rarer than hen's teeth. I thought it was almost impossible. So if you refused Hong Kong, they'd still keep you on the list and you get time credited to go to Sydney? Is that how that worked? Nope. I went no place the whole time, the whole year I was there, except Sydney. And what was that like? Oh, I loved it. I wanted for years after I came home, I'd love to go back to Australia. What was it like? I've never been there. Oh, the people are friendly. Uh, they spoke English. Got to sleep in a nice clean bed. That what I what I I had no money. I had <coughs> in Sydney. I had fifty dollars. So I got the cheapest room I could find. And how, I spent, how much was that a day? I don't remember how much it was a day. I remember that the fifty dollars I had just covered the room, a bottle of uh, black and white scotch. And a salami about that long. Oh my goodness. And that's what I lived on for that week. And all I did was walk around Sydney. A tourist. You just were a tourist looking Basically, at the, yeah. looking at the sights and so forth. What was your feeling when you knew you had to come back? That I was short. <laughs> I, I had a different feeling. When I was in Hong Kong, I planned on going AWOL. That was right after Diamond. And I thought I couldn't take, I couldn't, couldn't possibly do that again. And, and I actually planned uh, to, and now think of this thinking. I'm in Hong Kong. I've spent all my money. I've only got a one-way ticket back to Vietnam. Now how am I going to go AWOL and get back to Canada? I mean, it was illogical. I, but that's what I was thinking because of, I was so wound up you know, about about what was going on in Vietnam. So I actually, that plan of mine uh, lasted an additional seven days. I was gone for 14 days. And I never got, never thought about it, but I was AWOL on the eighth day. Do you remember what they did to guys in, in Vietnam if they were AWOL? Nope. They were, they were busted. They were Article 15, if not and worse. extended a year. So I didn't. I never even. I never even thought of it. So when when I came to my senses, I went down with that one-way ticket, packed my stuff, and went back to Vietnam. And then it came to me, I'm in trouble. And I'm in big trouble. And so as I was walking to that Quonset hut, I got off the the uh, helicopter and I walked towards Charlie Company, and the company clerk came out, and it was Mike Hunt, was the guy's name at the time. And he was coming out to do something, and he looked up, and he saw me coming. And he goes, Big John, you son of a bitch. And I said, what? And he goes, you know what? You could have got me sent to Long Bend. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, the day that you were supposed to come be back, I put you on the morning report. I've been covering you on the morning report every single day. In other words, as far as the Army knew, I was back there. And I said, man, what can I say? I did, I mean, what could you say? Yeah, said, what can you say? I said, buddy, I said, thank you. I said, uh, I, I, had, I experienced a few problems in Hong Kong. I didn't tell him, you know, that it was an intentional deal. But he goes, well, okay, now, you know, we got to get you back out to uh, Jackson is where we were at then. And so then I didn't even get a chance to do anything. They put me on a chopper and sent me back out to... Jackson is where we were at at that time, but uh, man, that was coming off of that R and R. I, you know, getting a taste of something that wasn't Vietnam was pretty good. You know, that was a pretty good deal. So Sydney, Australia. How many months did you serve 
in the wolf hounds. How many months did I serve what? In the wolf hounds with, with us. Well, pretty close to 12 months. Okay. Did they ever take you out for and let you go back to Coochie and do something else for a while? Nope. So when you left the field... Well, yeah, I did. When I was really short, when that, I got back from Sydney. That's what I meant. Yeah, I went back uh, to resupply. Okay. I was working in resupply. Yep, and most of the guys did, you know, that were that short. They just said, hey, we, we can't, it's not right. You know, remember they used to promise if you made it for for nine months, we'd get you a job offline, and that never happened. I don't remember the promise it, either. Yeah, that, that was the promise. But And later I found out, I talked to the first sergeant one time, and I said, why is it that none of our guys ever got offline, you know, on the nine-month mark? And he says, i got to be honest with you, Sarge. We were so shorthanded. There, the platoons were way under strength, and you guys were the only ones we had with experience. And he said, sorry. That's a, then you know when I thought about it, that's about right, you know. They, I think the promise was to give us hope, or to give us something to shoot for. But what backfired on them is when you'd been there ten months, you started to get short timers disease big time, you know. So, uh, were you ever wounded? The only thing I ever got was a couple of teeny weeny pieces of shrapnel in the back. And what was that from a RPG or what? Do you remember what, what explosion happened? Oh, you remember the night Alabama got shot? Yes, I do. Uh, it was probably one of those mortars that they were shooting yeah. at us. Okay, because it was a little trap of some kind that got you. Yeah. Did it? Did it bleed? I don't remember. It was in the shoulder blades. Okay. So then did Doc just... Yeah, when we got back, he just dug it out and said, Hey, you want me to, want me to, put, want me to put you in for a Purple Heart? <laughs> for that? No. And then well, he, Go ahead. He just dug them out with a pair of tweezers and handed them to me, and I put them in a Scripto lighter and kept it for a while, but then I lost the lighter. But if I'd known uh, Benny's you got for a Purple Heart, applying for government jobs, I would have said, yeah, put me in for that sucker. Absolutely. Two if you want to. <laughs> you know. So, and did you come home with any awards? Army Commendation Medal with B for Valor. That's okay. the only thing I got. Okay. But you were put in for... The more. Silver Star, yeah. And so you, you didn't come home with them, but you were put in for them. And as I recall, there was an incident where... Uh, Eichner <laughs> came out to the field and was going to present us. He was going to pin. What? Why didn't you get your medal pinned on? I don't remember what I was ticked off about something at the time. And as I recall, it it caused you problems because he didn't like that. Yeah. Well. We didn't like each other from the word go, but yeah. I know. And but anyway, there was something about if you don't do something, I'm gonna, you're not gonna make Sergeant Stripe or. <laughs> do you remember that? Oh yeah. Tell us, tell us just a little bit about that. I don't remember the, how the exact wording went, but uh, he told me to get out there and build a bunker for the mortar platoon. I says, Captain, you know, I'm short. I'm going back into. Coochie. <laughs> no, you're not. Says, oh, yes, I am. He says, are you going to disobey a direct order? And he says, I forget exactly how I put it. Says, what you going to do to me? Send me to Vietnam? <laughs> oh, that did Send it. me to Long Bin Jail? Go ahead. I'll be offline. That really pissed him off. <laughs> and so what did he tell He just you? tore up my sergeant's papers. I could give a shit less. I know, but that was the way it went over there. Right? I mean, that's just the way... That's well, that's the way it was with me even when I got back. I was what's known as a yo-yo. I made spec four four times <laughs> in, in three years. Explain that to me. Oh, I don't remember what all I did, but I didn't care for rank. I didn't care if I made sergeant. I was just in to do my three years and go home. Yeah. So as a yo-yo, did that mean... You must have dropped down a rank and then went back up a I rank. Went, and I hit PFC like three times, and, uh, or 
made spec four again. Was that because of disciplinary issues? I mean, is that oh, why they would remember. take? Is that why they take you down a rank? Yeah. Okay. I had. <laughs> well, you know, BD or not two fourteen, uh, two hundred one file. Yeah. My uh, every three months or whatever, they had to fill out a report on yep. how you were doing in yes. your job. Yep. I had excellent, 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 excellent. Bad attitude, not recommended for promotion. <laughs> And I, I had a colonel call me in one time and said, Lemire, why do you have such a bad attitude toward the Army? He says, sir, the Army had a bad attitude toward me first. And what was like three months later, I saw that same line in a Beetle Bailey comic strip. No, no. <laughs> was that Colonel Odie? Do you remember Colonel Odie? He was the one that flew around in the loach all the time. Oh, and the one who got an Article 15 written up for a loss of one light observation helicopter? You remember that. <laughs> okay. And uh, No, this was back when I got back in, okay. at Fort Lewis. Okay. I was going to say he would have been, he was the colonel, so he would have been the one that would have given you those words of wisdom. But uh, I'll never forget how infuriating it was. He'd be on the radio with, with RTO. Tell them to get online and assault. Get those guys up and move forward. And here we're in front of us are all spider holes. I, well, I always blame Harry Eichner for that. Yep. Well, C Colonel Odie was the one given the given the. They order, gave him the order. Give him the orders. And I'll tell you, I can't tell you how many times I wanted to shoot that helicopter down. Oh, well, if I'd known, never did. We were in, I believe it was Fire Support Base Jackson, and on this particular day. Donut Dollies came out to the field. And it was right after you and Eichner had really butted heads on something. Do you remember having a feeling of what, if you caught Eichner out in the open and you had an opportunity, do you remember that you had ill feelings towards him? I wish I'd known about fragging. <laughs> I didn't hear about fragging until after we got home. Okay. And, and this is the story, okay, that this is the story that went around. The story was is that you were in, in a certain place in your mind that if you had an opportunity and nobody was looking, you were going to shoot him. Oh, I would have shot him, yeah. And, and so a donut, you were looking, and a donut dolly got in between you and him, and that ended your, your, uh, thought, your, your thought process. I don't remember that. And no. I have, and I, I always wanted to know this. I have a picture from Jackson Fire Support Base of Eichner standing with his back to the to the uh, bunker line and a donut dolly standing right between him and the bunker line. I got the picture. And I often ask myself, God, I wonder if that was Lemire's donut dolly. <laughs> you know, but th those are the story. you know stories, how they go around. And of course, stories get bigger as time goes on, right? And And... One thing I've learned from the process of talking to all the guys, everybody, we could have had 10 guys at a firefight. And all everybody ten, remembers something different. A different point of view. And when you think about it, I was down here, you were down here, what you saw was certainly different than what I saw. But that's amazing. I, I mean, a lot of this stuff is kind of the same because we were all there, but their point of view or what they... And the details. And the details, yeah. So, okay, it's time for you to come home. You go to Long Bend again, and you're going to go get on the airplane to Benoit. They processed us out. What was your thought when you were standing? I think they had two lines, and you were going to go out and get on an airplane. What was your thought about that time? I'm going home. And I made it. I mean, I actually got through this. Actually, I was rather surprised because uh, Captain Eichner didn't want me to leave. He would not authorize me to go back to Coochie to get on the helicopter to go to Benoit. I just got on a resupply helicopter and went by myself. Yeah, yeah. he, he did not treat you very well, did he? Yeah, that's okay. I didn't treat him really well either. Well, you're saying one day you just decided it was time well, to go Well, no, it was home. his he, ETS. Oh, you he did had, He had a date he was supposed to be there. Ah. And do you remember what they used to tell us? If you're not here on your date, you're going to the back of the line. And nobody wanted to get sent back to the no, back. I don't of, remember that. Yeah, that, that was what they told us. You know, you better be there on your exact day or you're going to get, you know, you'll be in Vietnam for a while longer. Well, nobody wanted that. So that's interesting that you took matters into your own hands and 
you were going to get to your ETS date <laughs> one day or the other. And my attitude was, I don't want to be here one more day, but then I have to. And that was that was my philosophy. And uh, when you when you got back to, you probably flew in to Travis, and then they they took you to Oakland. Did you have to stay a couple of days to process in? I probably did, but I don't remember. Okay, it. and then were you, how did were you going to go home? I mean, yeah, I just flew out of uh, L.A. Okay, straight to Chicago. Okay, so that and your your intention was I'm just going home. Yep. Did it, did you experience any of the things that some of the guys did at the airports and at the gates leaving the base and stuff? Did you ever have anybody harass you in any way or? No, but we were definitely not treated well. Yep. Yep. You know, even back in Bay City, mm -hmm. looking for jobs, you got sneered on, you got spit on. Well, not literally, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah it, w it wasn't good, was it? Yeah, no. it really wasn't. And the thing I think that surprised me the most is I was clueless. Mm -hmm. I hadn't kept up on mm -hmm. local news, I guess, or something, and I didn't know what they were mad about. I knew there was protests, but I didn't think it was about me. I thought it was about the war. And somehow or another, it got attached to us. Yeah, because we were there. We were the ones fighting it. And that's that was something I didn't understand until later. What did what was it like to go home for the first time? Mom there. Yeah, my mom and dad were divorced. Okay. My dog was dead. Mm. Just natural causes, or? Well, my mother had to have him put to sleep because he was getting old. So he and he was. Well, that's, you know, doggone it, that's unfortunate. So, did you get another dog? I don't, I don't think I did for a long time. Okay. And were the folks, what questions did they have for you? What did they want to know about your service? I don't remember talking about it to anybody. Okay. And they were just glad you were home? Well, you got to remember... I didn't come straight home. I had a, another year, year and a half to serve because I was three, three year. Oh, I forgot. So, so I, I spent a year in, in Fort Lewis, Washington. Okay. Okay. So at Fort Lewis, what did you do there? Uh, almost got myself sent to Leavenworth again. <laughs> did they, what job did they give you to do? Uh, I was a teacher. I taught live fire. Okay. Hey, how, how, appro how appropriate was that? <laughs> And how, I was how did a, you almost get sent to Leavenworth? How what? Why did you almost get sent to Leavenworth? Oh, I was telling it like it is. I told, uh, with a lieutenant watching, no less, I didn't realize he was there. I told him, if you ever get a captain, get you up online, assaulting a bunch of gooks in a little spider hole, you shoot that son of a bitch because he's trying to get you killed. I don't, I don't know if <coughs> the lieutenant thought I was joking or not, but he never reported <coughs> Yeah, thank God. Thank God. And yeah. pro was he a vet? I mean, had he been over there? The <coughs> Did he? I don't think he was. He was a second lieutenant. Oh, okay. Because I was out of OCS. Yeah, yeah. Well, he was smart not to not to say anything. And by the way, guys like you and me, because I did, I went to Fort Campbell and did the same thing, and they gave me a booklet on what I was supposed to say word for word during, the, during the class, and it was your outline. And I looked at that and. Number one, I wasn't very good at memorizing stuff, so that kind of was a disadvantage. And secondly, I thought this stuff doesn't have any relevance to where these guys are going at all. I was teaching infantry, AIT. So, I mean, this has nothing to do with, with that. So, I, my classes were telling them exactly like it was. And my objective was, is if I can get to one guy and he'll listen to me and take me seriously, I might just be the reason he survives Vietnam. And that was my that was my whole thing. Now the colonel that was in the head commander of, of Fort of Fort Campbell unexpectedly nobody knew. He he had got heard rumors about my class. So he brought the three highest officers on the base and himself and snuck into the back of the bleachers when I started my class one day. And he listened to the whole thing and and he, they left. I, I never saw him. I didn't know they were there. And then the E7 over me came to me and he says, holy crap, do you know what just happened? And I said, no. 
and he said uh, the, the base commander and his entourage were here for your class. He, my guy, did, my supervisor had no clue, but he saw him leaving. And I thought, well, okay, so what? That's what I said to him, so what? And he goes, this could be bad. And he, he was a lifer. The C7, he goes, God, I hope this doesn't reflect on me. Sound familiar? <laughs> I hope this doesn't reflect on me. And I said, well, Sarge, it's what it is. You know, hey, if they don't like it, have, them do, have me do something else. So three days later, I get a note. Base commander wants to see you. He wants you to report to his office at 0800 in the morning. And E7 will take your, you know, fill in for you. And I thought, I, did, I wasn't even worried, but I thought, you know, this may be it. And I only had like two months to go and I was out. And I thought, wouldn't this be a shame if I get busted or I, you know, if they do something really bad to me and I've gone, I've survived this all this time. So I go in and, and Colonel Hamilton was his name and I walked into his office and I thought, man, he's going to lock my heels. And he said, come on in and sit down, Sarge. And he didn't even get up. He just sat in his chair and I said, yes, sir. And I kind of sat down and he says, you know, I want to talk to you about your class. And I thought, here it comes. And he said, Sergeant Quintrell, I don't know if you're aware of it, but I actually uh, was at one of your classes. And he said, I had the three, my three top officers on the base with me. And we listened to the whole thing and then we left and so forth. And we got together and we put our heads together and we came to a conclusion, Sarge. He says, the way that they're training at this base mm -hmm. is wrong. Mm -hmm. This typed out, this mm -hmm. army stuff that was probably from World War II, but they just changed the name to Vietnam. He said, you know what? It's not effective and we're not doing the guys any favors. He goes, after I heard your class, he said, I came back and we agreed. If we had guys teaching these new troops the way you're teaching, with telling them the truth and telling them what to expect and what not to do, what, how, to, how to handle certain situations, he said, we'd be sending guys over there that would be prepared. You know, the stuff, remember how old-fashioned some of the stuff was? They were still using World War II training stuff. And I said, well, thank, thank you. I, I said, that means a lot to me. He goes, well, he said, I'd like to thank you because you've really, you know, got some shakeup going here. And I said, well, gosh, I'm glad. And, and he says, I see, by the way, while you're here, I see you're just about ready to get out. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, I am. He goes, well, can I, can I talk to you about re-upping? <laughs> and usually it was the first sergeant or somebody that did that. And I said, sure. And he said, well, first of all, I'd like to tell you that I've gone through all your service records. And he says, I would like to offer you a direct commission. And I said, what, what do you mean? And he said, I will, you'll immediately be given the rank of captain, you're going to go to OCS, and you will be an officer. And like a dummy, I go, oh, great. And I said, then what do I do? Well, you're going to be going back to Vietnam. <laughs> Vietnam, and you, now you're going to be a company commander, just like Eichner was. Eichner was an E-7 at Fort Benning. They gave him a direct commission. I had no idea. He was, and Eichner's whole game was, he thought that if he could polish his apple good enough, that they might actually let him stay captain. That's not the way it worked. What, what Colonel Hamilton told me was, you'll go over and do your time in Vietnam, and if you decide to, to come back, then you'll go back to your original NCO rank. You won't be a captain anymore. In other words, what, what direct commissions were is to fill slots with experienced people, period. It well, had nothing to do with how many bars you had or anything. They needed to fill holes. And so, uh, and Eichner was furious about that. And when he ETSed out, they sent him right back to Benning and he was E7 again. And uh, he was really pissed. <laughs> I was gonna. I was gonna ask. Um, <clears throat> do you have any regrets about your service uh, in Vietnam? No. 
Are, well, are, are you okay? Go ahead. Do you remember the night or the day? Actually, it was full daytime. We found a couple of uh, what we thought might be VC, so we called in a helicopter to send them back for I, interrogation. I know exactly what you're going to say. Go if ahead. I'd known what they were going to do. I'd never have done it. Go ahead. Uh, as the helicopter with the two prisoners was flying off in the distance, we saw a body come tumbling out. And then a few seconds later, the second body came tumbling out. They just kicked him off the aircraft at like 400 feet. 500 maybe. And somebody said, should we go over there and see what, see if the, what happened? No, we're just going. Oh, you just felt like that was inhumane is what you were saying? Oh, we all did. Yeah. I mean, and the problem was, is they, one of those uh, South Vietnamese interpreter guys with the uh, real uh, tight pants and, the, and the, wet, the sidearm, so tight you could see the veins in his legs. Remember how hot they thought they were? Beret, remember? Yep. I, I remember them, but I don't well, remember you know, the, them being... The, when they picked those gooks up, he got on them and, and was yelling at them, and he stuck a gun in one of their mouths, trying to get them to tell something. And of course, they, not, neither one of them opened open their mouth. You know, never said a word. And that's, we'll take them back to Coochie and let those guys deal with them. And that's and everybody goes well. At least they'll get a chance. You know, to, they're they're not dead. Mm -hmm. Little did we know. But I also remember an incident where uh, I think the captain gave one of the uh, Arvin officers a prisoner and said, "Here, you take care of him." Which means you know you keep an eye on him until right. they get back. He took him out in the woods and shot him. Yep, that's exactly right. It, is there anything about your service? Uh, in the military that you're most proud of? I went. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's something to be proud of. When you got out of the army, did you get married? No. Did you ever, were you ever married? Uh, yeah, but uh, things did not work out. How old were you? Like 31. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you wait, you didn't just get out and jump into... No, if the girl that I had wanted to marry, had still been single, I might have, but no. Okay. And then, did you ever have any kids? One daughter. And what's her name? Jessica. Okay. And what is Jessica doing these days? Uh, she's married some guy down in Ohio somewhere. I never see her. Any grandkids? I believe so. Okay. But you just don't have a... Don't have any kind of relationship with them. Okay. Sis? Chris? No, uh, your sister. Sis? Yeah. Do you have any ties with with uh, the daughter? Not really. Don't you dare. I'm not. Not really. No, I'm okay, not. I mean, I sometimes another relative, they'll exchange Christmas cards, you know, or something. Even though this guy over here, he's out of the loop. I just was curious if somehow or another you had some kind of a connection. So, Larry, I want to know, did you, what's the definition of a hero to you? Uh, somebody who does their duty, although they're scared to death. Mm -hmm. And seeming like an impossible situation where it would probably be to everybody's benefit. <laughs> Hi. Skippy. Wanted to, that pup wanted to get in the interview. Skippy, come on. Skippy. Skippy. Oh, Skip. Skippy, come, come on. Come on, Skipper. Get out. Skip. Skippy. God, he, he, wanted his, he wanted his interview time. I'm not getting in. Come on, Skip. No, stay there. You're good, Just push him down. He'll, did you, did I'll help with the interview. Did you have any heroes that you can think of uh, from Vietnam or any, any time in your life? Skippy. No, stay down. What was that again? Did you have any anybody that you saw was a hero uh, in Vietnam or in your life or any of that? Uh, the only one was, like I said, Sugar Bear, and he did something I can't even remember what, and uh, because nobody saw it or nobody would write it up, he didn't get the medal he wanted for it. Mm -hmm. And he asked me if I'd write it up, but I didn't see it. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you bring that up, there were so many times that guys did really, really heroic things and, and nobody never, never even got an honorable mention for it. 
and so I, I, I agree with you 100% on that. And uh, what does the American flag mean to you? Uh, it's kind of hard to describe. The flag to me stands for my country, <coughs> but not my government. I did a little oral thing uh, for the Bay City or Bay County Historical Society where a little girl come and asked me about, you know, Vietnam. And I told her, if I had known then what I know now, and I had just heard that uh, Ho Chi Minh was the legally elected president of all of Vietnam, and it was America and the CIA that separated the country and put a dictator in the South. And if that was true, I might one day fight my country, or I might one day fight my government, but I will never again fight for my government. Mm -hmm. The country you, you well, I'll fight for my country, but I won't fight for its government. Yep, yep. Except maybe Trump. And what is your personal feelings about our president? I think he's pro the best president we've had since uh, Kennedy. And look what they did to Kennedy. I'm still uh, not sure who's, uh, who killed him. I know. No, I, I agree. And you and I both say, share the same feelings on that. And we all, we both have our suspicions on, on that. Uh, one of the things I'm impressed with is for the first time in our lifetime, besides Kennedy, he made a lot of promises. And he's trying to keep them. He's keeping a lot of them, you know. And when then you look at who's fighting him. I have two names that I've either made up or heard online. I'm pushing them. Libtard and Dempsey. I'm, I'm, Democratic Socialist. Oh, yes. Like the National Socialist, the one, Nazi. The ones that are coming up, trying to come up now. The ones that are pushing socialism. Yeah. Yeah, I was very pleased at one of his last speeches where he looked into the camera and he said, this country will never, ever be put under social... Remember that speech? I didn't, and, didn't and see it. She saw it. Was, was that the State of the Union? Yes, it was the State of the Union. And of course, the Republicans jumped out of their chairs and the camera pans and the Democrat states sitting on their thumbs, I rest my case. Remember what the original two parties in America were? Democratic Republicans? And I forget what the other one was. But the other one disappeared and the Democratic Republicans split. Well, now we've got the Republicans, who are for the Republic, and the Democratic Socialists who want to turn America into a socialist democracy. True. You bet. Yeah, that's true. So, and, and we're going to be living through a couple of interesting years here, I have a feeling. And uh, it's I, I, not I, going to be fun. Well, and I, my personal feeling is, is I think the, the, that the media paints such a negative picture and constantly. I'm who is behind Constantly, constantly. But I don't believe the majority of Americans feel that way. I don't believe the polls that show, like, uh, Trump has a 32% acceptance factor in the general populace. I ain't buying it. I don't either. And, of course, they never will tell you how the... Was it a scientific poll? Was it yeah, a telephone? Who are they polling? Was it a telephone? <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, What I, is their statistical universe? I, who are they asking I don't believe, these questions? I, I actually of? don't believe any of it. Do you watch Fox? I don't watch anybody anymore. Okay. And... Uh, uh, I'm going to ask you, for the generations coming up, when you and I are gone, what advice do you have for the people, the generations after we're gone, that come, come up? What advice do you have for them? I only have one piece of advice, and I posted it online. Buy a gun, lots of ammunition, and sequester it, because they are going to come for our guns. Mm -hmm. Yep, I agree. Uh, Larry, anything else I, I haven't brought up? Anything else you want to share with us? Oh, not really. It's brought back a few memories from Vietnam that I thought were funny at the time. Yep, and I didn't 
remind you of, you were the first guy that introduced me to science fiction. I, do you remember I came up to you and you were reading a book and I, I was kind of tormenting you at the time because I thought, why is he always reading a book? And I said, what are you reading? And you said, science fiction. And I said, well, what's that all about? Because I did not know about so I was not into that. And you just said, well, I'm not going to try to tell you about it. Here. And you reached around and you got a book. And you, and you said very seriously, if you're serious about learning about science fiction, read this. Do you remember what the title of that book was? If I remember right, it was Stranger in a Strange Land, but I'm not sure now. Okay. And what was the second book that you gave me? That I don't remember. The Greks Bring Gifts. I remember <laughs> that has stayed in my mind. Do you, well, do you remember the, the book? And oh, uh, Murray Leinster and Robert Heinlein were two of my favorite authors. Yeah. And something that I know about, too, that we've never talked about, I know that you became a science fiction book reviewer. Not that I ever heard. Yeah, of. I thought you used to give mm -hmm. reviews on books. Mm -hmm. Well, never. Not that I can ever I remember. I thought I thought for sure that you know, not for a job, but you know, like on on where people go and talk about science fiction and like on the li online and stuff. I thought you w would give reviews about about books that had come out and so forth. Yeah, I I have read the the old news groups the. Uh, Rec art science fiction written, mm -hmm. and I may have commented, but I've never reviewed books. Okay. Have you? Were you ever a Star Trek fan? Oh, uh, Star Trek the original series. When I was young, I liked, yep. but it's. I'm old enough now. I see the flaws. Oh sure, <laughs> and uh, Tribbles just weren't exactly. <laughs> you know. As near as I can Trump. figure, they're born pregnant. Tri Trouble with Tribbles. Now, my wife, Laura, is a maniac. She's a, f a fanatic. A That's a, a Star Trek freak. Yeah, she is. So... Uh, uh, Trekkie, that's what they Yeah, call that's exactly what they call them. Uh, I want to thank you so much for letting us come in and, and talk to you again. I, when I left, we took our picture together out on the porch, and I turned around and I said, I'm going to come back. Larry, I came back. I kept yes, my did. I kept my word, and Tim will testify to you. I mean, I don't want you to believe me, but there are more of the guys that are interested in you and what you're doing and how you're doing. I know it's hard for you to probably believe, but yeah, you, I, I, you were like you were like an icon in the platoon. I, I don't care. You were really an important. You ugh. did you did some really <laughs> outrageous. Do you remember our time in Tainan? Uh-huh. Do you remember when we were saddling up to go out to Nui Baden? Yeah. Do you remember what I was saying as we were saddling up to nope. leave? I'm too short for this. I can't be going, picking up my ammunition, putting on the way. I'm too short. I can't be going out there. We're all going to die out there. And I think that was when we went out, and that's when Alabama got shot. And, yeah. Uh, I forget the other guys. Was it Slovy? Name. Was Jack Slovy up there with him? Because Jack and Butler got shot, I think. They were walking point, right? No, I forget who the guy was walking point. I thought, I, well, he, Butler got shot one time walking point. Because... But uh, not serious enough to... Well, whoever it was, I'm afraid I may have had something to do with it, was right up near, like a giant ant hill, or, or you know, termite hill, that we were being mortared from behind. And I was back there with the machine gun, basically chewing the top off to the ant hill, and one of the mortar rounds, evidently I hit it just right and it blew up right really? there. Oh my but God. our point man was like right this side of the ant hill, and he got peppered with shrapnel. Mm -hmm. And uh, you remember the guy who committed suicide in the hospital, pulled out all his tubes? No, who was that? That was our point man, whoever he was, oh I don't my remember. Goodness. Oh my, I don't remember his name. I don't remember his name. That's a tragic. That's a tragedy. Yeah, I was always wondered why did you know like yep. fragments blow his balls off or something like that. Uh, the last time we talked many years ago, I asked you a question. I said, Larry, I've always tried to figure something out. 
in my mind, when we were in Vietnam, you did outrageous things. You did things that I couldn't even imagine anybody doing. You would get up in the middle of a firefight. You'd move your position. You'd when we got trapped on the side of, on the other side of Van Code Dong River, and we were pinned, and the guys back here could not shoot because they'd be shooting over our heads. We looked up, and here you are walking down the river, and you set up on a small mound, and you crossfired them. And I didn't have a chance to ask you at the time, but I never forgotten. And I said, Larry, what were you thinking? I probably wasn't. Was at the time the lieutenant said, "Let me hear." Six to nine round burst. Six to nine round burst. I said, six to nine round burst my ass. And I just kept spraying the hedgerow where we were receiving yep. fire from. Yep. And and I, I I dug a little deeper. I said, weren't you afraid of getting killed? And you gave me a very unusual answer that I had never expected you to give me. Do you remember what it was? Nope. You said, my philosophy in life is this. I've always believed that a person, number one, it's supposed to come up, it comes up. In other words, if you're destined to... There were two things that happened over in Vietnam that might have made me think that, that when we busted or got busted on by that ambush and they were mortaring us from behind mm -hmm. the termite mound, the berm right here, there's you know pebbles and trash up on it, and there's a bullet hit right in front of me and I went, whoosh, and a pet, one of the pebbles went, whoosh, and if it hadn't hit that pebble and gone like that, it would have got me right there. Made me wonder. <laughs> how, do you, how do you cope with, you know, I, I, I don't know if you and, and uh, Big John here have ever had conversations about PTSD or trauma. Do you have any support systems if you ever have a bad day? Uh, if you know, I know with Dad, he or with John here, he's he has a confidant uh, that ha, the that the VA is uh, given as a trustworthy someone he can talk to and who's helped him through just memories and processing and different things. Have you <coughs> ever had anything that I've never been bothered by it that yeah. way? Good. I think I went crazy over there, so I wouldn't have the problems back over in here. Bless your heart. <laughs> well. I'm going to tell you, and if every guy that we served was, with was in here, they would tell you the same thing. Pound for pound, you were one of the best soldiers that we ever had. And I know you don't want to accept that, but that's our story. And Larry, thank you. Well, if that's, if that's the way you remember it, I won't argue. <laughs> thank, thank you so much for, for letting us do this. And you know what? We're going to come back again someday. Yeah. I'll come back again someday. Mm -hmm.